Welcome Age of Vintage Society. Today I bring to you a very interesting question that many people have been discussing under my previous video. Could Anne Margaret save Elvis's life? Would things have been different if Elvis chose Anne Margaret? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. She starred in Kitten with a Whip, but these days actress Anne Margaret's the woman with the daredevil pussycat. She grew up in a small town of lumberjacks and farmers high up near the Arctic Circle. Her father worked in the United States during his youth and immigrated back in 1942, working with the Johnson Electrical Company. Anne Margaret and her mother moved to the USA four years later. When she filmed Viva Las Vegas with Elvis, the two began a relationship. The one, who for obvious reasons feared the couple's hot romance more than anyone else, was Priscilla Ann Bewley, then just a schoolgirl who had just turned 18, who lived secretly at Graceland and who had just left high school. And Margaret was the opposite of Priscilla. She sparkled, she could dance, she could sing, she could be sexy, but also shy and family loving. You could joke with her and she joked back. A hot and gorgeous thing with pizzazz. She was both smart and humble, and she rode a bike. No wonder Elvis fell for her. He couldn't help falling in love. A read of her autobiography, and she wrote it, makes it pretty clear that they were in love. She doesn't say it in so many words, but she says it in enough words. And they clearly meant a great deal to each other. They loved each other. It probably couldn't last, but they had a real meaningful connection with each other. They understood each other. They both came from small towns. They both loved motorcycles. And they both were uncomfortable in their spotlight of Hollywood. And I think that's what connected them to each other during the duration of Elvis's life. I think my understanding of it is, we should all be so lucky to have a friendship that's as meaningful as the one between Anne Margaret and Elvis Presley. Outside of Elvis Presley's family, Anne Margaret was the most important woman in the entertainer's life. Playing opposite Elvis in 1963's Viva Las Vegas, she became the most memorable of Presley's leading ladies during his Hollywood career. The personal relationship they shared through the years provides a fairy tale interlude in Presley's curious life story, which ended so sadly in 1977. The Swedish immigrant first met Elvis in early July 1963 on a sound stage at Radio Recorder's studios in Hollywood. That day they were introduced to each other and the press as the stars of MGM's upcoming film, Viva Las Vegas. It was 28-year-old Presley's 14th film, while at age 22 Anne Margaret's career was just starting to explode. Her previous film, Bye Bye Birdie, released just three months before she reported for work on Viva Las Vegas, made her an instant star. Birdie cast member Dick Van Dyke said a more fitting title for the movie would have been the Anne Margaret story. In her 1994 autobiography, Anne Margaret recalled her introduction to Elvis Presley. Except for a piano, the MGM soundstage where Elvis and I met was empty. In the background, a few of his guys hung around observing their boss, a ritual I would soon come to expect. Under the watchful gaze of director George Sidney, a studio photographer snapped shots of what the film company executives figured would be a historic moment. Elvis Presley, I'd like you to meet a wonderful young lady, Anne Margaret, said George Sidney. Anne Margaret, this is Elvis Presley. 
The significance was lost on Elvis and me. I reached out my hand and he shook it gently. I've heard a lot about you, we said at the same time, which made us laugh and broke the ice. In addition to launching the couple's professional relationship, the meeting was the beginning of a personal one as well. I'm not really sure why I was so calm about meeting the King, and margaret noted. After all, this was Elvis, a man who had captured the heart of almost every woman in America. Little did I know, he would soon capture mine. Before filming began, the two had to record their musical numbers. On July 9th to the 10th, they each recorded their separate songs at radio recorders. Then on July 11th, they entered the studio together to work on three duets. The Lady Loves Me, You're the Boss, and Today, Tomorrow and Forever. Three days later, the cast and crew travelled to Las Vegas, where they checked in at the Sahara Hotel. On July 15th, local filming began in the city and continued until July 26th. After a weekend move back to Los Angeles, filming resumed at MGM Studios and ran through August into the first week of September. And margaret could tell the partnership was working. I'm sure that the producers knew that the fast-paced Boy Meets Girl musical would certainly be improved if the chemistry between Lucky and Rusty were right. Initially, Elvis and I might have admitted that the only heat between us came from the hot desert sun, but others saw sparks from the start. Soon it became obvious to all. A P correspondent wrote, They hold hands, they disappear into his dressing room between shots, they lunch together in seclusion. According to Anne Margaret, the energy of the music drew her and Elvis together immediately. We experienced music in the same visceral way. Music ignited a fiery pent-up passion inside Elvis and inside me. It was an odd, embarrassing, funny, inspiring and wonderful sensation. We looked at each other, move and saw virtual mirror images. When Elvis thrust his pelvis, mine slammed forward too. When his shoulder dropped, I was down there with him. When he whirled, I was already on my heel. And margaret understood Elvis's Memphis Mafia. As they worked together, Anne margaret says they discovered many things they had in common. In addition to the music, they shared a passion for motorcycles, a love of family, a desire for privacy, a devotion to God, and late-night talks. Early during filming, Elvis asked her to go out with him and the guys to see a show in Las Vegas. It was an innocent, friendly date, she remembered. I was used to having my parents accompany me on dates, so Elvis's entourage wasn't a problem. His guys always treated me wonderfully. In return, Elvis's buddies always felt comfortable when she was around. She made his life a little easier because she understood him and didn't make any demands on him. Elvis's cousin Billy Smith recalled, she even understood his need for us. Priscilla never understood that. Marty Lacker added, Anne genuinely liked people and she liked every one of us. She wasn't intimidated or threatened by us. I think she also respected us. We used to have a lot of fun with her. She had a terrific sense of humour. We called her Rusty because that was her name in the movie and because of her red hair. As Elvis became more comfortable with Anne Margaret, however, they began to spend more time alone. I knew I'd crossed into a certain uncharted territory when Elvis asked to be alone with me, but later the frequency with which it happened made me happy. It meant Elvis truly trusted me. During their private time together, Elvis opened up to her, perhaps more than he ever had with any other person in his life. She felt she came to know his heart intimately. Like everyone else, Elvis had dreams and desires, hopes and hurts, wants and weaknesses. 
He didn't reveal this vulnerable side until everyone had disappeared, until those private moments when we were alone, after darkness had blanketed the city and we'd parked somewhere up in the hills and could look down upon the sprawl of LA or up at the stars. The Camera Angle Controversy The only threat to their relationship during the Viva Las Vegas shoot was their egos, and Margaret admitted she had one, and no one would deny Elvis did as well. A case in point is the favouritism director George Sidney allegedly gave Anne Margaret during filming. Elvis cronies Red West, Lamar Fike, Joe Esposito and Sonny West have all accused Sidney of giving Anne Margaret favourable camera angles at Elvis's expense. Reportedly Elvis's complaints were passed on to Colonel Parker who took Sidney to task. According to Presley biographer Peter Goralnik, the colonel confronted the producers, reminding them that this was an Elvis Presley picture. He didn't buy MGM's argument that featuring Anne Margaret would draw a wider audience to the film. Goralnik even reported that Parker used his power to pull from the film two of the three duets recorded by the two stars. A viewing of the final edit of Viva Las Vegas reveals that Elvis clearly received the most exposure musically. He had six solo numbers to only two for Anne Margaret. Her strength as a dancer was featured naturally, but overall Viva Las Vegas comes across as an Elvis Presley film with Anne Margaret as a strong leading lady. None of the pro-Presley accusers blamed Anne Margaret for the director's perceived favouritism of her, and she didn't mention the controversy in her book. If Elvis let some professional jealousy show in the camera angle controversy, it didn't spill over into his personal relationship with Anne Margaret. By all accounts, that developed quickly into a full-blown love affair. Elvis's affair with Anne Margaret was not just an affair, declared Lamar Fike. He was really in love with her. It got hot and heavy. Marty Lacker added, neither one of them was married and they really cared a lot about each other. And Priscilla was back at Graceland. For her part in her book, Anne Margaret avoided passionate details of her relationship with Elvis, instead focusing on the motorcycle rides and other adventures they shared as close friends. Still, it's apparent their intimate relationship continued long after filming on Viva Las Vegas had been concluded. In his book, Jerry Schilling reported seeing Anne Margaret enter Elvis's California home late at night in the fall of 1964, with her own key and make her way up to Elvis's bedroom. Marty Lacker claims she used to write him letters and sign them Bunny or Thumper, and she'd called Graceland and used the same code. And Anne Margaret admitted in her book that Elvis knew I loved pink and had commissioned a round pink bed in a moment of tenderness. Elvis had to fulfil his commitment. Inevitably though, at least to Anne Margaret it seemed their love affair had to end, she explained in her autobiography. There were other factors in Elvis's life that forced him apart from me, and I understood them. Elvis had always been honest with me, but still it was a confusing situation. We continued to see each other periodically until we had dated for almost a year. Then everything halted. We knew the relationship had to end, that Elvis had to fulfill his commitment. That commitment was marrying Priscilla in Las Vegas on May 1st, 1967, and Margaret made a similar commitment a week later when she married actor Roger Smith in the same city. And Margaret wed fellow big screen heartthrob Roger Smith in 1967, and the two would go on to have one of the longest marriages in Hollywood history. 
Smith passed away in 2017 as the two marked their 50th year of marriage. For the remaining 10 years of Elvis's life, he and Anne Margaret remained good and loyal friends. When she made her first appearance on the Las Vegas stage in June 1967, Elvis sent her a guitar-shaped floral arrangement. He continued the practice for all of her Las Vegas openings for the rest of his life. When Elvis opened at the International Hotel on July 31, 1969, and Margaret was in the audience, according to Lamar Fike. Throughout the 70s, both would attend the other's Las Vegas shows when possible and visit with each other afterwards. In the 70s, both would struggle with drug dependencies, while Elvis abused prescription medications and Margaret fought alcohol addiction. I reached a point where my days and nights blended into one continuous foggy state of inebriation, she explained. I'd drink a fifth of scotch, pass out, wake up, drink some more and pass out again. I suffered periods that I couldn't remember. And Margaret overcame her addiction. Elvis did not. In early 1977 she heard rumours about Elvis's poor health. When Joe Esposito came to her show at the Tropicana in Las Vegas, she asked him how Elvis was doing. Don't worry, he told her, everything's fine. There are a few problems, but we're taking care of them. And Margaret, faithful to the end. When she opened at the Hilton on August 15th, 1977, for the first time in 10 years, there was no flower arrangement or telegram from Elvis. The next morning, a phone call from Graceland brought the devastating news. Joe Esposito explained it was going to be a madhouse in Memphis for the funeral and advised her not to come. We're coming, she told him. When she arrived at Graceland, she and Vernon embraced. There was so much to say, to recount, she recalled, but instead we cried. Vernon said softly, he was so proud of you. Three months later, Elvis's father and Colonel Parker asked her to host a two-hour Elvis NBC tribute, Memories of Elvis. She described it as one of the most difficult, wrenching jobs she had ever undertaken. In early 1979, on hearing that Vernon Presley was seriously ill, and Margaret flew to Memphis to visit him. We had a good visit, laughing and crying and trading stories, she recalled. He told me how much he missed his son, and I said that I missed him too. To comfort him, she occasionally called Vernon during the months leading up to his death on June the 26th, 1979. Marty Lacker, one of Elvis's best men at his wedding, once wrote, If Elvis had ended up with Thumper, this whole story might have wound up differently. If you like this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. For an exclusive video about Anne Margaret, visit our Patreon page. We show you how Anne Margaret avoids all kinds of Elvis-related questions during an interview. Now it is your turn. Could Anne Margaret have saved Elvis from himself when no one else could?